Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. And it's so fun to be able to see so many friends and neighbors here. Uh, know how busy everybody is too. So thanks for fitting this into your busy schedules tonight. I wanted to be able to come back after the legislative session, it was my very first legislative session, to come back and report back of what took place. So kind of the game plan for the next couple of minutes here, we're gonna jump in and give you just an overview of the state legislature, talk about kind of a day in a life of a representative, what took place up there, um, give an overview of the session, go over uh, kind of the voting decision process that I went through. We'll talk budgets about the state budgets, we'll go through some bills, um, takeaways, kind of next steps moving forward. And as we're going through all of this information, if you have questions or comments, please just jump right in so we can have just a good discussion tonight. And we'll be really sensitive um, to everyone's schedule. We'll plan to finish this at eight o'clock, but if you wanna stick around afterward and just visit or any questions as well, we'd be happy to be able to do that as well. And we also wanted to thank Spanish Fork Television for being here tonight. We'll all try to be on our very best behavior because you're all gonna be on TV and on Spanish Fork's uh, YouTube channel as well. So I appreciate Spanish Fork's involvement. Um, and so what took place here, uh, the legislature in Utah is a part-time legislature, meaning there's no full-time legislators in Utah like some other states. So everybody has full-time day jobs, but then for 45 days a year, the legislature convenes up at the state capitol and it'll start in January and go to about the first week of um, March. It's 45 consecutive days, Monday through Friday. So this year's session started on January the 18th and it went to Friday, March 4th. And I'm glad that there's a hard deadline because by law it has to be on the 4th at midnight. So that night we were voting on bills until about 11.58 and they said session's over and they tapped the gavel at midnight. So I'm glad that there's a hard deadline so it just won't go on and on and on and on as well. Now, during the legislative session, representatives and senators are also paid. I looked at it of what would this be like um, and figured out by the amount of hours that are spent during the session, my hourly rate was about $14.50 an hour. And that was before taxes. And I think that that's really kind of good because it's all about public service. Um, and you know, I was going through Wendy's the other day to get a Frosty and I saw that they were hiring for about $15 an hour. <laughs> so I think I might maybe you know, go over there and check out Wendy's a little bit. And so everything that takes place um, outside the legislative session, like tonight's gathering and correspondence and working throughout the year when they're not in session, there's no compensation for that. And I, I think that's good because this is all just about public service. Now, um, um, in, this, in the legislature, there are 75 representatives and they each represent about 44,000 people. And then there are 29 senators and the senators each represent about 110,000 people. And the legislative kind of two big areas of responsibility by the constitution is working on the state budgets and also bills and legislation. So those are kind of the two big broad areas that the legislature focuses on. Now, before this legislative session began, yes, Ken. Is sharing with us where the 44,000 come from, what your area is? Oh, excellent. Great question, Kim. So our, we're in legislative district. Now, during the session, it was 65. The number has just changed. So going forward, we're in House District 63. And House District 63 covers Springville. It's about half of Springville from Main Street East so the east and it loops around on the south part of Springville. It covers all of Mapleton and then it covers about half of Spanish Fork. So Highway 6, everything north of Highway 6 and then at the front at the canyon where the windmills are by the golf course and up on the ridge of the mountain. So that's the part of Springville. So that's the geographic area of House District 63 going forward. Thanks for asking. Now before the legislative session began, I wanted to be prepared to be able to go up and represent our district. I was elected in November, so I was the new kid on the block at the legislature this year. 
Um, Representative Francis Gibson, who lives here in Mapleton, he had served for about 13, 14 years in the legislature. He made an announcement that he was stepping down, so there was an elect special election held in November. And so when, when that election took place, I wanted to be able to come up to speed and learn as much as possible. So these are some of the individuals and organizations that I met with prior to the session. And it was so informative and really helpful to me because I view a representative's job is to represent our area and that really the elected officials are not in charge of the state of Utah, but it's we the people that are in charge of the state. And so really being able to um, meet with about over 180 constituents here in the area, and then we held information meetings uh, listening um, right here in this room before the legislative session did. We did that in Springville and Spanish Fork as well to be able to get input of here are some topics or potential bills, different items that might come up and what is on your mind so I'd be able to be informed to the best ability to go up to the legislative session. Now, um, when it all began on that first day, I'll kind of show you my kind of a daily schedule. This was kind of always in flux every day. It kind of adjusted a little bit. I would start the morning at five o'clock, um, start doing research on bills and doing emails at seven, uh, six to seven. Meetings would start at seven o'clock and the meetings would go, um, there will be then jumping into committee meetings from about eight to 10 o'clock in the morning. And then you go right on the house floor to start uh, debating and voting on bills for a couple of hours, like from about 10 to noon. And then at noon, being able to have a working lunch and caucus meetings. And then you would jump back to floor time from about two to four. And then committees would jump in from about four to six. In the evenings, there would be legislative meetings or functions. And then at about nine o'clock is when I would start researching the bills and corresponding and emails and do that until about midnight or one o'clock in the morning. So that was the schedule during the 45 day session. And it was a fun adventure. It was exciting. It was like you're on a high speed roller coaster at the same time. And, um, and I'll tell you kind of what happened during, this, uh, during the session here. During this time as well, I really appreciated everyone in our house district's input. I received just over 6,000 emails in the 45 days. That was kind of averaging about 200 emails a day that I tried to respond to day of that they came in. And because you're giving me great input and I'm seeing so many of you are emailing me and I just greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, also, at the end of every week, I prepared a summary recap of the session and emailed that out to just over 8,000 registered voters in the area. I was able to get that list through the Lieutenant Governor's office and to be able to provide an update. About, I would get about 50 texts a day on different issues from people living here within our area, plus voicemails. I created a video going into the session, kind of a mid-session recap, and at the end of the session, kind of a video recap summarizing things, and then tried to post keeping things informed about three or four times on, um, a week on social media. One of my very favorite parts was being able to have so many from our area come up to the Capitol. The, I know of just over 300 that met with me that I was able to visit with up there on the hill, and each representative could have one person with them on the house floor at a time. And so it was a real privilege to be able to have 52 individuals from our community be able to come up and sit on the House floor. And that was a tremendous honor for me. So going into next year's legislative session, please come up to the Capitol and I would be honored to be able to have you come and sit on the House floor with me during the discussions and the debates. Here's just a couple of pictures. Um, I see a lot of you, my goodness, friends that were up here, you see yourself. These are just a couple of examples from classes to schools, to our police chiefs, to our mayors and city council and school board and teachers and neighbors and friends, and just really appreciated um, everybody's involvement. Now, on the, when, you, uh, when the session began, I was assigned to three legislative committees. Uh, the committees were economic development and workforce services. The second was criminal justice law enforcement and the third was public ed appropriations. And I was really grateful for these three committees. Um, they're really important committees and a lot of important 
issues and bills came through these particular committees. Now, a great resource is going to the legislative website, le.utah.gov, and you click on committees and all of the legislative committees are listed. You can click on the committee and see who serves on the committee. Every discussion, every debate, every bill is archived there by video and audio and transcript. So you can go in and see what's happening in any of the committees at any time during the session or throughout the year. So it's a really a great resource. Now with all of this juggling, um, you know, juggling uh, family, um, juggling um, legislatives, juggling full-time work, church responsibilities, just like all of us are doing this time, was a, a big um, balancing act during all of this. I was really grateful for my employer, which is Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions, for their understanding of the session and working with me with my schedule so I could still stay employed. And they, they were wonderful. Um, really appreciated um, um, everybody who helped me to be able to do this. And especially um, for my family, you don't see them very much during 45 days. And um, we kind of joke that we live in the White House. <laughs> you know, Stephen White, that's a bad joke. And, and the real president of, is my wife, Roxanne. She was the president, she was the CFO, the COO, the CFO, uh, running everything with five kids and the Uber driver and doing everything while I was away. So I just wanted to thank her for her support because it would not happen without her and with everybody's help. Well, during this session, here's an overview of what took place. And I know these numbers are a little bit small. There were 1,273 bills and topics that were started on before the legislative sessions started and during the session. So that's about 1,200, about 1,300 different topics and different issues. If we look over on the left, the HB or House bills, there were 535 bills coming through the House. On the right, SB, there were 279 bills going through the Senate. And you could go down a little bit lower under passed, the House passed 305 bills, the Senate passed 208 bills. Now with every bill, you can make amendments, they call them substitutions, to be able to change the text as it goes through the process to hopefully help them make the bill even better. There were 700 substitute bills created as well going through all of this process. And so overall, at the end of the day, there were 513 bills that were passed uh, through the 45-day session. Um, now, to be able to kind of keep track of all of that and all of these different, over a thousand different topics, I created uh, just a personal tracking sheet. And I just took a screenshot of this so you'd be able to kind of see what took place. It was just an Excel sheet. And this is, a, you know, there's about 41, 40 bills there and it'll go down to over a thousand of them. I would put the bill number, the title of the bill, an executive summary with background notes and who the sponsor was of that bill. And then sliding to the right, I would have a column that would show how I voted for it. The next column is why I voted for that, the rationale. And the next line was the constituent input. What did all of you tell me to do on this particular bill? So for example, I would put their name, where they were from in our district, and if they opposed or supported it. Um, you can also see, um, there was a lot that said no constituent input. As I looked at everything holistically, there were probably about 99% of all the bills that went through that I didn't get any constituent input on. And I wanted to be able to make the most informed, best decision for our area. And I'll kind of walk you through the rationale and the approach that I took. So first, I personally researched that bill, uh, do everything I could to be able to understand it. Um, you don't have a full-time staff up there, but you do have a college intern, and mine was absolutely fabulous. He's from Utah State studying law and constitutional studies. So he was there from early morning to late at night, and he was fabulous. He would do a lot of background research as well on all of the different issues and the topics. I would then first and foremost go, what does our district want on this particular bill? And look at everyone's input. The next step, I would uh, look at what the committees were talking about on that bill. Now, if a bill went through a committee that I wasn't on, 
You can, and anybody can go listen to that committee meeting. You can hear the public input, you can hear the debate, you can hear the pros and cons, you can hear the discussion, the committee members, and see how everybody voted. So that was really informative to hear what happened in the committee. A bill has to pass committee before it can go to the House for a full vote. Another piece I will look at would be kind of organizational input. For example, what, would the, what is the PTA saying about this bill? Or what does the Utah League of Cities and Towns saying about this bill? Or what is the Chambers of Commerce saying about this bill? So kind of collective groups. And, and that was really helpful. Uh, then I would look and visit with lobbyists, but I would look at lobbyists on both sides of the issue to be able to understand both points of view and to make sure no one was trying to pull the wool over my eyes as well. Then the other piece, because this is a part-time legislature, everyone has full-time jobs. So there's a, one of the chief economists for Zions Bank is a representative. He was fabulous about anything with the economy. There were doctors, ranchers, farmers, um, teachers, everyone who lives and breathes this on a daily basis, being able to go talk to them to get their insights and their input as well. And then the last piece would be when it came to the floor for discussion and for a vote, being able to use that as well. So I kind of went through that eight step process on each bill to make the most informed vote that I could to be able to help our district. So that's kind of the thought and the rationale that would go in to each of the issues. Now, I know I'm doing a lot of talking here. Any questions so far? Yes. You go through some of those bills, like you know, the ones that we didn't have input and in how you voted. And yeah. Explain some of those bills. Maybe start with yeah. the most controversial one first. <laughs> oh, that's a good place to start. We've got a lot of good ones here. Absolutely. In fact, I, we can really jump into bills right now, and that will be a section here in just a minute, if that's okay. We'll go to some of those, because there were some of those hot topic bills that were pretty sensitive and passionate feelings on both sides of them. We'll go through there, and I'll show you what they were and how I voted and the rationale for those as well. So thank you. Yeah. Maybe just in line with the numbers you just showed, even with all that research, I just can't imagine that you, if there's got to be a lot of bills where you just can't know everything about it, but you got to vote. Yeah. So was there a lot of that? How do you deal with that? It's now, you look at this, 500, I believe, five, was it 531 bills? A lot of them are referred to as cleanup bills, meaning these were bills and laws that were passed long time ago or in the past. And because of things happening in Utah or laws changing or just something, they need just a little minor tweak. And so a big bulk of those 531 bills were referenced as cleanup bills. And so to be able to do that, these bills were long, but on the, on the, on the legislative site that's all public, you can go in and look at the text of the bill and you can, there's a, a little link that's called, um, uh, I think it's text tracking, something like that. You click that, you can scroll down the whole bill and, and the only changes are highlighted in red so you can see those little tiny changes. And sometimes these bills would only have a couple of word changes. So you wouldn't have to review the full bill. They were just making a couple of tweaks to get it into compliance with what was happening. So that was a big, big help, especially with those big, big bills. Yes. Yeah, great question, there is. Um, the, the number formula up there to get a bill passed into law is 38-15-1, meaning you have to have 38 representatives that would pass the House, 15 senators to pass the Senate, and the one governor. So a bill can be passed with a 38-15-1 formula, that ratio. To be able to get it veto-proof, the House, the representatives would need to have 50 votes or more to be able to have that super majority that the, the, the governor could still veto it. But if he did, there would be enough votes to be able to come back to overturn that veto. Yeah. So there is those numbers, just like back in Congress. Yeah. Yes. Is it automatic that the senators would again vote to go against the governor if he passed it? Is it guaranteed? Um, they change their mind because the governor passed it. Boy, that's a good question. Um, 
if, if the governor passes a bill after it went through the House and the Senate, it becomes law, but then either chamber, the chambers can decide to bring that back and to override it. Or another option is to come back in a special session at a later time to kind of vote against the governor's decision as well. I think I asked it wrong. If he vetoes it, would they automatically oh. undo the veto? If, the if it passes the House and Senate and the governor vetoes it, Yeah, if, if there was, they could, what's that? They have to go back and vote again. You would have to come back and each chamber would have to vote again for it. But that could overturn the governor's veto. What if it's on the last day? What if it's on the last day? Now you're going down a particular bill right here. In fact, you want to just jump into that bill right now? Let's jump into this bill right here. Bear with me one second. Okay, so this issue is HB 11. Can everyone see that on the screen okay? This is a bill that's called Student Eligibility in Interscholastic Activities. This has also sometimes been referred to in the media as the trans Transgender Athlete Bill. So here's the background and the context. Across the United States, they're starting to see a trend where a transgender, uh, I'll step back, where a, uh, a man, a young man transitions to become a female and that female, that transgender athlete, then wants to compete in female sports. And so they're starting to see this happen a little bit more across the United States. Here's just one example if you want to read a little bit more about it for background and context. This is happening, this is the Sport Illustrated story and it's online, it's in the March issue right now. This is a transgender um, athlete who is competing and breaking all of the female records with swimming. And so it's caused some questions and concerns about if this is fair and if this is a right or, or wrong or not. So that's kind of a national discussion that state by state is doing. There have been about 10 states right now that have banned transgender athletes competing in girls sports. And so those are in the other states, those are now immediate lawsuits and they're in the courts right now playing out as well. So last year in the legislative session, the legislature had a bill that would ban this from happening in Utah, ban transgender athletes in Utah. It went through the legislative process and it died through the legislative process, so nothing happened in that bill last legislative session in 2021. During the interim last summer, different individuals and stakeholders got together to be able to talk about this more. And what emerged from the conversations over the summer with the stakeholders in the state, it emerged into this bill that went through the session this year, which was titled HB 11 Student Eligibility and Interscholastic Activities. This bill was different from the one a year ago. This particular bill created a commission that would make the decision on a case by case situation. And so this commission would be comprised of different experts. There would be physiologists, doctors, mental health, coaches, different individuals that would see um, a person and the situation from all the different perspectives. And so if a transgender athlete wanted to play, they would go to the commission, make that request essentially, and they would, the commission would have a set criteria to be able to determine if that student would be able to play in that female sport. So on a case by case situation. So that was the bill. That was the only option that went through the legislative session. And it emerged as kind of a compromise with all of the different um, stakeholders over the summer. So that bill went through, it went through all of the committees. It went through the House committee and passed. It went through the House um, floor and it passed and I voted for it on the House floor. It then went to the Senate, it went to the Senate committee, it passed the Senate committee. And then the Senate committee held, I mean, the, sorry, the Senate held on to it for a couple of weeks. I think maybe just a lot of other bills and things that way. The Senate brought up that bill on the last night of the legislative session at about 8.30 p.m. and the session closes at 12 o'clock. So they brought it up on the floor and they started making some amendments, some substitution and changing the language of that bill. They made some changes to it in a couple of areas. They said, we are going to ban completely transgender um, athletes from competing in sports, um, just like last year's bill did. So they made that change. 
in female sports. Thank you for the clarification. Yep, so that's one of the amendments. The other piece of it, they said, if there is a lawsuit now that would come to the state, um, then the responsibility of the litigation and the cost of that lawsuit would now fall upon the school district. So the school districts now would be responsible for the litigation and the payment of all of those legal fees. So with those two changes, oh, and then the other thing, when a lawsuit happened, then this commission would jump into effect, would begin, and they would start it on a case-by-case -case situation. So does that all make sense? So they kind of made three big adjustments to it. Well, this was happening and it went through the Senate and it passed the Senate, just barely. So at about 10 o'clock that night, that bill came back to the House, about two hours before the end of the session. There was the discussion and the debate on the floor. And so I was thinking naturally what to do in this particular situation. And looking at all of this and seeing the process of all of it, my concern was the changing of the litigation and the cost of this now being on the backs of the local school districts. Whereas before it would be on the state and knowing school districts and their budgets and manpower, that was a big, big concern to me. And as a result, I voted against those Senate amendments thinking we've got to be able to, rather than try to rush something through in two hours, let's look at this a little bit more. And I was just concerned about the school districts throughout the state with the cost of, with the cost of it. I do have personal concerns and the input, the overwhelming input too, um, is that it's not fair to be able to have a transgender athlete competing in female sports as well. So the vote took place. Um, there were enough votes that it passed the House, banning transgender athletes completely from competing in female sports, and now the burden of the costs are on the local school districts. So that last night it went through the Senate and the House. So that bill, right after that passed, the governor announced that he was going to veto this bill when it arrived on his desk. So it passed, the bill is now going to the governor, and so the governor is gonna have a decision to make whether to support this or to veto the bill. From everything that he is saying that he will veto the bill. If he vetoes the bill, that means we're essentially back to square one. And so path moving forward, another bill could be presented and worked on for the next legislative session, or another potential option is, and I don't know if this will even happen, the legislature could reconvene to come back and see if there's enough votes to overturn the governor's veto. So there's kind of two paths going forward, depending upon what the governor does. And how long is that reconvening of the House and the Senate at that point? Oh, how, how soon could they reconvene? How soon and how long is that, is that process? You know what, that is a really good question. I don't know, but I can find out. I can find out. I'll let you know. And I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if that would happen or not. So can I ask for all of your input? Because I need to represent you. Can I maybe just by a hand of vote? Because I know we could spend an entire evening just on this one bill, and there's other things you probably want to discuss as well. The question is, could I just ask you maybe this by, by raise of hand, just for input. How many of you feel like the state of Utah should ban transgender athletes from competing in female sports. Okay, thank you. How many of you feel otherwise to go along with the compromise of doing it on a case-by-case -case situation with the commission looking at the criteria to see if that should happen? Do you mind raising your hands on that one? Which one affects the school district? The second would be that commission making a decision on a case-by-case -case situation. How many, feel comfortable, raise your hand if you wouldn't mind. On, again, the budget, you know, I, my, uh, I, individual school districts, you get a small school district being sued and they'll wipe out their whole budget. Yeah. So that that's, would be Okay. A, okay. Thank you. Important. That is, that is a, that's a piece of the criteria and that was on my mind that night for that last vote. Okay, a couple inputs here, and then if it's okay, I don't want to just rush past this really important topic. There are some other ones that I need your input on as well. As well, so yes. 
So yeah. my question is about um, the, the criteria that you voted against it was about the state, the school districts having to bear the cost. Do you think when the Senate changed the language of that, that was, what do you think their motivation was to change that language? What was the rationale they gave to yeah. change that from the state to the school districts? I'm wondering if there's any possibility they were trying to tank the bill, mm. looking like they were supporting it, but tanking it with that. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know either because it happened just on those last couple of hours of the session. So I don't know the rationale or the reasoning of making that change. It feels a little bit like a game, like mm -hmm. we're going to support it, but then we're going to. Okay, hmm. thank you. Yes, Linda. I just wanted to make a comment that we have a Republican governor and our Republican Party platform clearly states that we support the traditional family. So I feel like he, you know, undercut us. He's a Republican governor and he should be supporting our Republican platform. Amen. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I saw another comment right over here. Yeah. I think this is unfortunately characterized as you are either fully supportive of women in sports or, and, that, and that means family transgender. I really think that's a false choice. Yeah. And I think that's the problem with this bill, or at least how it's characterized. Uh, you, you mentioned that you were talking about, it was about this process. And to me, I really liked where they had talked and sort of come to a compromise where they felt respected, right, these individuals. And yeah. they just kind of swept that out from under them, right? And so that kind of, so I'm fully in support of women, protecting women in sports, right? But I also feel like we have to show some respect to our transgender yeah. youth. And that, that's a really good point, because that's another piece on my, on, the, on my mind. We have great neighbors and friends right here in Springville, Spanish Fork, and Mapleton who have family members that will be affected by this. And they're friends and our neighbors right here in our community. So there needs to be that respect and the compassion at the same time. And so that it is the way that this has kind of been set up is, is rather challenging. Well, and they, they have, they had done that. The commissioners have done that in coming to this compromise. It may have been, not everybody loved it, but it was at least the best they could do. And there's yeah. also clear indications that this would get overturned by a judge. Yeah. And you can say, well, let the judicial process play itself out. But if you, we, if there are clear, even President Adams has said, yeah, this probably gets overturned in, in, in just yeah. So why are you going to pass a bill that we have pretty clear indication that it's not going to be upheld in court? Okay. Oh, this is good. Thank you for the, op the really insightful and meaningful comments here. Let's do two more if we can. And if it's all right, we'll go back to another bill if that's okay. Definitely. I need some help on another one. A lot of times people are in the process when they don't have the facts on their side. Yeah. The second one, they just, oh, I don't like the process. The second one is, say, oh, it's going to get overturned, let's forget it, let's not do anything, that's, again, abrogating our responsibility as people or as legislatures and just saying, uh, we'll give all the power to the court. The people do not, as a great majority, do not support men, males who use in women's sports. They don't. We can argue processes, commissions, until the cows come home, but that's not what people want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, I'm not even sure what my opinion is. I feel like I'm not, I'm not informed enough to, to have an opinion yet on this particular issue. I feel like I haven't done my research, but what I do value in a representative, and I appreciate from you, is that you did not vote in favor of something that you felt was being rushed through the process, right? Mm -hmm. Like at the end, in the, those last two hours, you said you voted against it, right? Yes. And I appreciate that. And that's exactly the type of quality that I look for in someone to represent me, not someone who just will vote because that's the way that the party is voting or because someone has told you to vote that way, but because you feel like the process is important. That, that dialogue of coming to an agreement, a compromise, 
of, and I loved your, your eight step process of hearing all the different stakeholders about a bill so that you can make the most informed decision. Um, and so I just wanted to say I appreciate that and, and I, I'm yeah, really, really glad that, that that is how you're approaching these types of controversial issues. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your input and I, I need your help on this. I really believe as a state we'd be able to figure this out in the best way forward. Um, that is, if I can, um, that is one of the takeaways from the legislative session. I really think that the way Utah approaches and works on things is an example to our nation. And that how it, it was, if I can say refreshing, hopeful, if I could maybe even use the word inspiring, of being able to see people up there trying to come together to solve really tough issues. I'll give you one quick example. There is a representative up there who um, is an anesthesiologist. She's brilliant and uh, she's in the Democratic Party. She ran a bill to increase the number of nurses in our schools. And because it's needed in Utah, our averages are so below the national averages. And so I was looking at this bill wondering how, what, what, you know, I don't know a lot about this. Let me go to the roles that really do. So I called uh, Nebel School District, visited with the superintendent and others, and they had real big concerns about this in some particular areas of the language. And they recommended that I vote against the bill. Well, I, in conversations, everyone's working up there really trying to solve issues. I went to this other representative who wrote the bill and expressed the concerns and the challenges and the recommendations as I was getting. And I said, hey, would, would you be willing to visit with Nebel School District? And she goes, I'd be happy to. So we got a phone call where Nebel School District and her were visiting and explained the concerns. And she said, you know what? I didn't even consider that particular piece of that concern in this bill. And Nebel School District said, you know, if we made some adjustments with these words, that would fix the concern from our end. She goes, that's just fine with me. We made those edits, those amendments, that substitutes. Nebo is fully on board. And so I felt comfortable fully supporting it. Um, the House did, and it passed the House, and that bill moved forward. So I thought that was a great example of collaboration working together. So I think what we're seeing in social media and national news and other parts of the country, it's not happening here. And so it's been refreshing about, I think Utah really is a, as an example to the nation. Well, you guys wanna stay until 1 a.m.? We could go all night, everybody. Let's, let's, let's jump back into another one. I need your input on something here that's gonna be happening. To me, particularly, this is the biggest issue facing the state right now. I'll cover just background to set the context really quickly. There is, a, on the legislative website, le.utah.gov is the budget for the state of Utah. And you can go on and click any of these buttons and there's great visuals and charts and you can click on them. You can literally see every dollar that's coming into the state of Utah and exactly how the state is spending every dollar. So it's all open up there and it's a great, great, really helpful resource. Now, right now we have in Utah an unprecedented amount of money. This is coming from two different areas. There's the Utah's healthy economy is healthy and it's growing. Look at these accolades that Utah is getting from across the country. It's the third best state for business. It's the um, number one is the most independent state. Number one on economic outlook. Um, number one for stability and potential. Utah is doing really well overall with the economy. Now, the second piece of this, of this unprecedented amount of money is the other source of the money and that's from the federal pandemic stimulus. Because of the pandemic and DC printing and creating all this additional money, which I personally think is reckless and irresponsible and it's causing a lot of issues right now, Utah alone got $30 billion last year. Well, that's a good question. And that's been kind of some of the conversations. Do we send it back or do we use it? And if we use it, how do we strategically use it? So because of this, we're seeing unemployment rates in Utah, lowest in the nation. We're seeing job growth as well. Now, the challenges that we're seeing, we're seeing inflation. 
because of the federal stimulus with all this funding, that's really the driving factor for the inflation. Before the session started, the headlines we were at a 30 year high. We're now at a 40 year high for inflation. We're also seeing supply chain disruptions. We're seeing a demand for products. We're seeing wage inflation going up because of the shortage in labor. We're seeing the infusion of federal funding. The interest rates, the Federal Reserve, was it today or tomorrow, are going to increase interest rates for the first time in three years. They anticipate anticipating raising interest rates four times this year. And some economists are saying it could be as many as six times this year. So the Federal Reserve is intentionally doing this, trying to slow down the economy. And so with all of these moving variable pieces out there, it causes some uncertainty with consumers as well. So the challenges and the Utah's approach for this is that Utah has a balanced budget amendment. It's by law that we can't spend more than we take in. I think it's one of the very best decisions our ancestors ever made. And that's one of the reasons we're having the stability that we have in the state. The other aspect is we need to look to the future. The biggest challenge and opportunity the, grow, uh, the state is uh, facing right now is growth. In the next 30 years, there will be an additional 1 million people just in Utah County alone. Can you imagine that? 1 million people in 30 years just in Utah County alone. So planning and preparing for this growth, even that we're getting right now, is so expensive as well. The other piece is this, this funding the state has decided to be able to use should not be used really quickly in one year. Otherwise, it will cause hyperinflation in the state of Utah. And so the strategy um, from the economists, from the state budget directors, um, people we looked at and the legislature was to invest in capital projects that are big ticket projects that we need to be able to have for intergenerational investments with all of the growth that we're having. That, that's a hard decision. Do we send the money back to DC? Do we use this funding, which is a lot of it is already our taxpayers money that's in DC that's coming back to us as well. So that's a whole big conversation in and of itself right there. But the, the, the strategy is to spread out this um, money over a period of m many years and to also put the economy's money into savings and to rainy day accounts. So that's kind of the strategy the state is looking at. And a couple comments here. Yes. One of the questions that I have about that is how much of that money came because of EMAC requests? The reason is because within emergency management, when it comes to those federal funds, there's normally a, uh, you can only spend it on this or this or this. There's a name for that. So those are federal funds. What's the name behind what they're saying that we have to spend those things on? Yeah, yeah. Because it sounds like it's, to me, it's federal funds. They need to go back to the federal government if, if, the, if it's not gonna be used for, for certain things. If they're saying that it has to be done for this, 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 that I don't want, send it back. Okay. Because if, EMAC is EMAC, and I don't like EMAC because it always has a catch, a, a, a catch on the end of it. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> well, my feelings were similar to his. I wanna know what is it the federal government requires of Utah yeah. in exchange for that money? Yep. For instance, what if they say, oh, well, you have to have let transgender, transgender people participate in athletics because this is federal money and so this is yeah. this, this is the there's always a name there's always something that yeah. you must do it, yeah. and it, that's how they catch you they catch you by the hook with this money yeah. so you gotta figure out and I wanna know where that money has a name if not we send it back it yeah. should not it, it should not be part of uh, part of our budget because it's an emergency funds yeah Great, great points. And we have to be really careful with the federal funds come here because they come with st st strings attached yes, with that do. as well. And especially in other areas of the funding, this particular area, the federal government said they have to be spent on transportation and infrastructure, um, a couple of other areas for criteria. I, and to me, I'm saying no. I don't want none of all that. infrastructure because infrastructure ends up being fence somewhere down in Fair, uh, in Fair Utah somewhere. Yeah. No, okay. that goes back. To me, okay. 
thank, help me. thank you for the input. If I can show you in just a second where this funding is going to be going, um, I'll show you all of that as well here in just one second. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to get into whether we should keep the money or not, but one of my comments would be the state, we have all this influx of people, and the money and the infrastructure goes to these highly populated people places which keeps drawing people in. Yeah. What the state gives lip service to but does not do a good job of is putting infrastructure, needed infrastructure, in rural areas that are not able to grow because they don't have a water system, they don't have a sewer system, etc. I've met with the state people on this and I got these wonderful programs that provide three million dollars for the entire state for a year. Yeah. You know, there's just there's a lot of lip service to it. Cox gives it a lot of lip service, but there's no, when you, de when you deal with the county commissioners out of these rural areas, they go, we'd love to do it, we want to do it, we've got zero dollars. Yeah, so I heard, okay, I heard the same thing. There's a rural caucus that meets every Friday morning as well, and those were the conversations as well. So I'll show you how all this was happening here. Um, let's go right here for a second to the issue. Utah right now uh, for the last 80 years has had a really unique state budgeting system compared to all other states. Back in the 1940s, a constitutional amendment was made in Utah that said any income tax will go to education and any of the sales tax will go to the general fund. So there's been the income tax account and the general fund account, and it's been working in Utah, and it's the evidence of what we're seeing today, it's worked well for about 80 years, but starting about two years ago, it started not working, and it's going to get a little bit worse and worse, because here's what's happening. The economy is going really well, so income overall in the state is good, and there's more income tax coming in into this big account. Then sales tax, it's decreasing in the state because we're buying stuff more online and we're paying less sales tax as well. So the general fund is not growing as fast as the income account. And so the general fund covers all of the expenses throughout the entire state. So we have one area that has a good amount of money in it, another area that doesn't, but you can't transfer money from one account to another account because it's in the state constitution. And so there's really not an issue with the amount of money the state needs. The issue is the flexibility of moving the funds. But then this is where it gets a little interesting and a little sensitive and there's really strong feelings on it. The income is dedicated to education. And so there's potential concerns. If we remove any of the funds from the income account over to the general fund, will that negatively impact education in the state? And we don't want that to happen at all because educating their kids, that's the future, that's the foundation, that's the economy, that's workforce services, that, that's critical. But at the same time, here they're saying in about, we'll start seeing it more next year with budget constraints. The next year after that will even be worse about this fund not covering all of the expenses in the state, especially as the population increases. So that's the dilemma that's in the state right now. The only way to be able to make that change from one count to the other count, or having flexibility to move money where it's needed is through a constitutional amendment. And that's where all of us, everyone in Utah would vote on. So you may have seen this during the legislative session about halfway through, this question was started to be raised. Do we try to do a constitutional amendment this year? It only can happen every two years, so this is the year. So the conversation was started. Do, do we look at this issue to determine how to fix this challenge right now or wait a little while? The concern is if we wait a little while, it might be too late. And rather than having a big problem to fix, do we get ahead of the problem? So it started raising the conversations. There was the conversation, do we do this or not? It ended up being, let's not pursue this right now because we, everybody felt it was gonna be too rushed. And there is a lot of 
decisions need to be made. We don't want unintended consequences. And a lot of input, especially from education community, was like, we need to be able to look at this and spend just a little bit of time so we can make sure we get this right. So that is the issue before us. It's good, this conversations, we're gonna see it more in the media. I'm confident it will be in the legislative session next year talking more about it. But that's the underlying basis, the reason, the situation that we're having right now. And, but nothing can be passed by the legislature because it's a constitutional amendment. It's something all of us will vote on when it comes to a time for the ballot. That's the background, yeah. So is the general fund um, finished? Uh, does that include infrastructure or is it primarily salaries? Infrastructure, that's a piece of it. That general fund, it covers everything from water, public safety, senior services, social services, air quality, infrastructure, transportation, air, everything for the state. When you, when you say education, then I think, oh, but as a taxpayer, additionally, I look at property taxes yeah. steadily go up because I understand that we have more children and they need to go to more yeah. schools. And, yep. um, and so that's an additional tax that we're paying. Yeah, yep. So that, that's, for my mind, seeing all of the issues through the session, this is one I think is a really a big one for us to all collectively figure out um, how to be able to do this, um, to be able to help cover the expenses in the state without jeopardizing or hurting anybody or organizations that are involved. Emily. I think so. I think that's a great idea. And also, could, in the meantime, we use the federal funds where we're not having that balance, like where we're having the issues in the general fund, mm. right? I think all options are on the table, really. Um, that WPU as a guaranteed percentage could, could be a possibility. WPU? Oh, you guys, this has been fascinating. I've turned into a geek learning all these crazy <laughs> acronyms here. WPU is... Um, step back. The state guarantees education for all students. It's, a con it's in the Constitution. The state guarantees that they will pay this much for every student in the state. And the main cost might be this much. The difference is made up by our property tax. So the state will fund up to a level, and that's called WPU, the weighted per pupil. Weighted pupil unit. Thank you, weighted pupil unit. Thank you. They'll give a guarantee that much money, and then the property tax covers the difference. So guaranteeing funding ongoing for students, um, I think that's a great recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Darren. You also mentioned that in the state fund, that comes through sales tax. Everybody buys stuff online and hardly ever pays sales tax. Why can't we introduce that? And another thing I see a lot of lately, it's like, why is everybody driving with Montana license plates? They buy their $100,000 Porsche and license it in Montana because there's no s property tax for cars there mm. and drive it here. Or Arizona, because there's no sales tax when you buy a car in Arizona. Mm. I mean, yeah. So those are options, those ideas, I think they can be on the table to be able to adjust the amounts in the dental funds. Okay, one more and then we'll go on to another exciting topic. How's this? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned when you start dipping into somebody else's account that you just keep dipping and pretty soon you don't have it. It's kind of like our Medicare, it just it started, you couldn't touch it. Yeah. Once they open that door, now it's nearly bankrupt. Yeah. So that is my major concern about dipping into something else that has more money. And you're not the only one. I feel the same concern, and a lot do, especially everyone in the education community, because it could be viewed as dipping into that to help other expenses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I give you a little bit more background? Are we, are we okay with this one? Because they saw this issue two years ago, 
There was an Amendment G on the, on the Constitution that everyone, the majority of Utahns voted for it. What it did, this income tax account, it expanded the usage of that. It was just K through 12 and higher ed. Amendment G that passed two years ago expanded that to children and those with disabilities to provide a little bit more flexibility of how it could be used. So they started that two years ago. They thought that that would provide a benefit for many years, but with all the population growth of Utah, it only gave just a couple of years of help and they're seeing more help as needed. Can I, um, can I share a couple things that will affect us really right here on the ground, boots on the ground, right here within our house district? Um, one of them is tax cuts. Because of this strong economy, we were able, the legislature voted, be able to do tax cuts for $193 million. This was really carefully analyzed by all the experts, the economists, the state budget directors. Everyone felt like this tax, because the amount of money is there, there was two options. Keep spending it on other things in the state or give it back to everybody. And I voted for it, give it back to everybody. Um, and we did it strategically in three different ways. The first is it will benefit um, the low and moderate income tax earners, um, those um, by an earned income tax credit that also incentivizes them for work. So that particular piece of it will help 81,000 Utahns on the lower end of the income scale. The second piece of the tax cut will be for the most vulnerable seniors that are on fixed incomes. So those specifically will be a tax cut on their um, social security, which is essentially a double taxation anyway. So that particular tax cut for the seniors, the vulnerable seniors, will help 71,000 seniors throughout the state. And then we reduce the state's income tax rate from 4.9%, 4.95% to 4.8%, 85% that will help everybody in the state as well. So collectively, um, it was 193 million. And so what's remarkable to me is really how Utah has managed the economy and the budgets up to this point. Other states right now are in tremendous debt. They're cutting basic services and programs and really having a hard time. Utah, on the other hand, we have major investments into areas that will help us, plus we're able to do tax cuts at the same time. So that's some good news that I think will be able to help everyone here within our area. Let me jump to transportation really quickly. Yeah. Your last comment was pretty um, impactful, and I, I just think we ought to clap for our state. Oh, AJ, well, thank you. Thank you. I, I was so grateful that we were able to collectively come together as a state to be able to do that. Um, let me show you, oh, infrastructure. Here's a couple of things that happened. With the population growth just in Utah County and planning ahead for all the population, here is one aspect of it. They, uh, there was funding that was approved. This was the work of Representative Gibson over a, quite a long time. And then this turned into a political football this last year as well. But we were able to get it across the finish line with the funding. There will be a new exit on I-15 between Springville and Spanish Fork, just north of the new hospital there. That whole area with farmland, it's all being developed into homes right now. So there's going to be a new east-west road coming from the old highway between Springville and Spanish Fork. Um, it will be there 1600 south in Springville with this new exit. So we were able to get that 30 million transfer to be able to start that. We will start seeing, according to UDOT, construction at the end of this year for that. So that will help us be able to have an east-west corridor. So that's good news, that's good news. Another piece of it, yes? We have one big problem. You're exactly <laughs> right. You're exactly right. So it's going to be a T on the old road between Springville and Spanish Fork. There is a phase two that's planned for this. Nothing is set in stone. Nothing has been decided on and it needs a lot of public input because that extension, that phase two will extend that over into Mapleton, essentially over by that new light 
going between Mapleton and Springville. We'll tie it in. So it will be a direct line from Mapleton, this area, right into that new road. Now that raises a couple of big issues because there's people living there. Nothing has been decided. And they say that that decision will be 15 to 20 years out. And I'm thinking that's a long time too with all the population growth, but that's a big issue. I'm glad you brought that up that needs to be determined. And everyone in the area here will be involved in that with the public input to decide what will be best of how to be able to do that. Another, another piece of this is, can everyone see this right here? Front runner right now goes to Provo. The plan is to extend front runner from Provo down to Payson. That project alone right now would cost $700 million to do. It has to go through a lot of steps to be able to even get to that point. There is corridors that are already planned. Development's already starting to go into pace and knowing that this will eventually come down there one day in, the, in a couple of years or so. And so, but before any additional planning can happen, it needs to do an environmental impact study. And so we were able to get funding this time for $5 million to do the impact study, which will take a couple of years to be able to extend that down to Payson. And so that plan can start moving forward a little bit more. That will help specifically Springville and Spanish Fork planning where things are going to be. So that's something good for the growth that's coming, especially in South County. Another piece of it that's going to, that we're wrapping right here, this is a topic that's been discussed by Mapleton City, Springville City, and Spanish Fork City for quite a while. There's two train tracks coming out of the a canyon here. Um, one of them goes through Spanish Fork and the other one goes through Mapleton here. The conversations between the cities and with a UDOT and with the Union Pacific is to consolidate those two rail lines into one line. And so the funding, as was passed this session, 40 million and an additional grant will be coming to help offset additional expenses to be able to consolidate those two lines. So the Spanish Fork Railroad line will eventually disappear. This decision to do that and the rationale, one of the rationales, that will save the state just over $90 million with all of the repairs that needed to be made along that way. The other long-term benefit of that is that when that extension, that new road, the interstate that's going hitting that T that we just talked about, that would right now have to cross two railroad tracks, but now it would just cross one railroad track. So that can help simplify things and reduce expenses. So that consolidation will start moving forward. And the trains that are going to come through Mapleton now, we've been told will be silent crossings. So there should be less honking. That's a clap right there. Less honking with the trains. Okay, another good piece of investment is that in Spanish Fork, you're seeing all that congestion that's happening getting off that Spanish Fork exit. There's going to be a new interchange that's there and that funding was able to get through to do an environmental impact study of $5 million to be able to make that plan as well. Now, so those are some major big investments in South Utah County for transportation. Um, another good thing that's happening that will help along Wasatch Front is Front Runner. I don't know, how many of you ever ridden Front Runner before? Okay, I have two, I think it's awesome, it's great. But sometimes it's a little slow and it's like every 30 minutes and a lot of people aren't using it because it's not happening as frequently as possible and the train's coming back and forth. The thought is to try to speed up the trains back and forth. And so right now it's slow because it's just one track. They're going to double track Front Runner to be able to make the Front Runner trains run every 15 minutes. And so that will help increase public transportation and help take cars off the road as well. So that will be a long-term investment to help public transportation along the Wasatch Front. Well, yes, Dick. Having lived in Chicago for a long time, they had, Burlington Northern had some trains that would stop at virtually every stop during the day. And then, but at commuter times, they would have trains that would go straight through, or maybe one or two stops. So yeah. don't know if there's any way to, to look at that. But, yeah, there was a lot of commuting going on, and if you only had to stop twice or none at all, it was very popular. 
Yeah, I hope they do that here. Roxanne and I, we, when we lived in New York City, we were commuting in about an hour on those trains into Grand Central Station every morning and night, and we would always try to time it to catch the direct, the express, because the express. you didn't have to stop, stop, stop. So I really hope that that will happen in the future. One additional, this is time, one additional one. I just want to mention that you, because this one um, is personally meaningful to me. There's a lot of teenagers that are experiencing a lot of mental health challenges right now, and there's a lot of parents that are trying to help their kids and sometimes don't know how to help their kids. Well, a couple years ago, United Way of Utah County started a program. They funded themselves through private donations called Everyday Strong. It was created by child psychiatrists, and it took off like wildfire. They have already helped 90,000 families and the requests keep coming in and they just can't keep up it because it's um, because of the funding. And so I was able to do a request for allocation to be able to get an additional $170,000 and United Way will be able to match that dollar for dollar to be able to help provide that resource to more families and parents helping their kids um, with just challenges that they're facing right now. So if any of you know of anyone that needs any help or resources, with that, you can just Google United Way of Utah County Everyday Strong, and it's free, the resources are there, and it's just getting great reviews and helping a lot of people. So we were glad to be able to get that across the line as well. Well, all of you, yes. And just, if you were not receiving Steve's weekly updates during the legislative session, if you'll make sure that you get on this list, then we'll make sure that you start receiving his periodic updates now that the session's over, but then when the session starts again in January, he sends out a weekly email that tells you all of kind of the hot topics. It, it puts out his full voting record so you know exactly how he's been voting. So, and just personally, Steve and I have been active in our precinct for 20 years. And honestly, we've tried to, Steve has made a huge effort to do the things that he wished his legislators would have done up to this point. So. I don't know if you've ever been to a session like this where somebody met with you before the session and after the session to report. We've never seen it. So I hope that yeah. it's been helpful. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Maybe just to wrap up all of this, three takeaways. I mentioned one of them about people trying to really work together to solve problems. The other two takeaways from this whole experience is that I am so grateful for our ancestors in Utah. Boy, the sacrifice and the work and the planning that they put forward just so we could enjoy what we're doing today. Every morning when I walked in that Capitol, there's two huge murals. There's one above the Supreme Court chamber showing the pioneers coming into the Salt Lake Valley. And then there's a huge mural above the House of Representatives chamber front doors. And it's showing this family with their covered wagon, a campfire, the plow, they're cooking, and they are establishing and settling and planning for Utah going forward. And to me, that was just inspiring each day to be able to see what's happened before so we can enjoy what we have right now. And it's an opportunity for us right now to be able to plan for our kids and our grandkids, especially with the population that's coming in. And so that was a takeaway that I am so grateful that we are so fortunate to be in this great state. And the last takeaway is that it just how grateful I am to be able to serve and to be able to represent you. And I am um, the first to tell you, I don't have all the information and I don't have all of the answers on all of these issues, but I really like the word team. To me, it's an acronym. Together, everyone achieves more. And so I appreciate you being involved and being involved in your precincts and your caucuses and serving and being good neighbors and being involved in a part of all of this because I believe that collectively as we work together, we'll be able to solve these problems and to be able to continue to make our communities and our state even better for the future. So thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve and work with all of you. Um, please contact me at any time. You know, the legislative session is now finished. It starts next January. There'll be some interim meetings and committee meetings um, throughout the year, a couple of days. Um, but as we're planning for even right now, next session, as issues are on your mind or ideas or concerns or recommendations, please share those right now because we can start 
working and tackling and looking at those in preparation for next year as well. So thanks for being here tonight and thanks for staying a little bit longer. And I appreciate all of you and I'll look forward to seeing you around town. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.